<coughs> Good morning to you. Is the start maximum speed, please? I heard something about uh, an event tonight, or it's not clear what 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 you're talking. Event. What was that? Six thirty, not six. Highland. My church is here in Hammond, so I don't know. Convince me. Why should I go there? What's going there? You're going to be enlightened by uh, a gentleman. Enlightening. I don't need to be enlightened. I have a lot of light here. Uh, enlightened in your heart <laughs> with the preaching of the word, the gospel. Preaching. I am the preacher. I'm. Su no, no, I'm not going. Convince me. Convince me. <laughs> that is the good way. That is the good way. Uh, don't think for a second that somebody else can do your job and your job and your job. Let's hire Pastor Freaking. He will do it, and we will enjoy and listening, and we'll say, "Wow, beautiful!" and go home, and nothing happens. But this later. Let's open the magic book and the helper, which is the Sabbath School Quarterly. And pray one more time, Lord, we need your understanding from above. We need to figure out what's going on in this world and in our lives in order to turn to you as the only one who can help us, who can give us the hope for the present and the faith for tomorrow and the faith for present, and the hope for tomorrow. In Jesus we pray, amen. amen. Okay, let's begin here. What's the title of the Sabbath School Quarterly? The Central Issue, Love or Selfishness. Central Issue, Love or Selfishness. Can you describe uh, selfishness? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Me, 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 I, I, I. <laughs> Can you describe love in one line? God. Good. Yes. <laughs> Selflessness. Selfishness versus selflessness. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Why is this central issue? There are other issues that we are talking about. So there are two candidates running for an office, let's say, be the president, you know? And they are talking about, uh, let's say, there are potholes on the highway and they are too much sugar in candies and some people are for and some people are against that. Is this central for our lives and for our country? No. <laughs> this is a diversion. Instead of talking about our national debt and what's going on with this violence, yeah? They are talking about uh, gay and lesbian rights. And yeah, this is central. No, this is not central. This is not central. I don't want to be political here. I remember a book when I was young, Gulliver's Travels. You know that? Mr. Gulliver somehow got stranded in an island. The island is called Lilliput, with people like this. <laughs> Very small. 
but there were two uh, two competing uh, uh, kingdoms there. It was Lilliput and it was Blef Blefusku. And they had, they had a central issue. They were speaking the same language. They looked the same. Everything was the same. But the Lilliput, they love eggs. And they're breaking the eggs on the oval side. The Blefusku, they're breaking the eggs on the uh, what's the name? Winter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and they. This is not a central issue. You know. Now, tell me some things that are there to some of us, but they are not central issues in this. Great controversy bell. My family and their salvation? No. <laughs> yes. Picking sides in, in, in the political Yes. Yes. This is not who's supposed to, who we are, you know. This is not who's supposed we are. For years and years in Romania, pastors were not allowed to have beard. It was a policy. If you are, want to be a pastor, you have to be, uh, to be married and not to have a beard. Uh, half of our pastors have mustache. And some of them, the young ones, let the mustache going all around here <laughs> and have a little opening here. Is that a beard? No, it's a mustache. That is not central. And in this war, this is great controversy, Satan is pushing us to fight something that is not central. Memory scripture? Let me hear someone there. Anita, do you have it? Yes. Fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Thank you. It's a war. And God's saying, fear not. Why is not saying, stay home, don't go to war? And I will protect you in your home. Why is saying, I am with you, instead of, I will spare you to go to war? Okay. Because he's asking us to go and do something. Oh. Uh -huh. Do what? Preach the gospel. Sh share, share Jesus with people. What's that? <laughs> I heard this, uh, share Jesus with people, but I just came from uh, the street here. Oh, this is a church. Let me hear what you are saying. And you're saying, share Jesus. What's that? Can I ask you a question? No, you have to. Uh... <laughs> I think as we attend church on Sabbath morning, the look on our face can be a witness to somebody. We should, we should be the happiest people in Hammond this morning. Yes, very good, but I will scare them with my face. <laughs> I have more wrinkles than ever before because the clock is ticking in, the, in one direction. Welcome. Hi. Why God is not saying, uh, you guys, you stay here and uh, um, let them fight, let them kill themselves. Ah. Here is peace, there is war. But instead of that, you know, he's asking us to be involved in this war. However, he promised 
that he strength, he is going to strengthen us. Yeah. He's going to be our helper with a righteous right hand. Righteous right hand. So you know, right and left in the Bible, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that it's important. What is, what is the theme of the first, let's say, two or three days here? What, what, uh, um, what event is underlined from the very beginning in, uh, in this uh, uh, lesson? The destruction, the destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of Jerusalem. How can you... How can you put together love or selfishness together with the destruction of Jerusalem? Baffles me. What the destruction of Jerusalem have anything to do with love? Huh? huh? With love? Yeah. Tell me. Well, first of all, the whole issue we're talking about is the assault on God's character by Satan. Oh. So there's, there's two sides to this battle. Uh -huh. Jesus was trying to reach the Jewish population, letting them know that God was love. They were refusing to learn that, mm. so, so Jesus was predicting disaster for them. Ooh. Then the disaster, it's... Disaster came, yes. Why he didn't spare them from the disaster? This is another question. That's the point I want to make. Yes. In that after all, Jerusalem was God's chosen people. Oh, yes. Yes. And the time came when they needed protection, and seemingly we did not intervene because, as we know, Jerusalem was flat. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. Hold your comments. I prepare a uh, documentary of about five minutes about this event. Um, uh, some of things are self-explanatory. Some of other things are just history for us to have the background and comment after that. And move after that from the destruction of Jerusalem to the end times and our role. Because it's not something history. It's also something eschatological pertaining to the end times future. So, Brother Chris, let's hear. Titus, the son of the we Roman Emperor Vespasian, to, who was in command of the, the four screen. month siege ah. of Jerusalem, ordered his entire. Okay. Yes, see. This one. Titus, the son of the Roman Emperor Vespasian, who was in command of the four-month siege of Jerusalem, ordered... Yeah, you, you need to move it to the... Yes, a video, yes. We have to move it to this screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. The entire army to prepare to storm the temple at dawn. A total of 60,000 Roman legionaries and local auxiliaries were eager to deliver the final blow to the defiant but broken there. city. Uh, put a stop, please. Stop, yes. Click with the right and opening. Open with, let's see. Open with. It's not giving you option to open to... Uh, using a program. No, 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 it's nothing because there are some graphics there. Uh, can you use this computer that I have here? Can you connect this computer? <laughs> you see, with a TV it's easier. <laughs> Can you use this computer, someone? Let me use this one to connect it, to connect. Oh, man.
Uh, it's fine, we can go along, but uh, there were <clears throat> three points there. It's, it's made by uh, uh, amazing facts. It was a good, uh, it's a good way to understand what happened in Jerusalem and how Christians fled and uh, it's not, it's not working, okay. Let's move uh, to the Sunday section. Sunday section. Remember, we have to ask questions, questions. I'm not here to preach. We are here in at the end of Jesus' ministry. He began ministry in Galilee, doing this. He went to Jerusalem two or three times. But now he is moving his ministry in Jerusalem, the capital, a beautiful city, the holy city. And he was overlooking the site, temple, magnificent, and Jesus did everything he could save his people from the coming destruction of their beloved city. Okay, this is the line that we have here. <coughs> and I am asking you, did he really, did everything he could to save his people? Think of something that he didn't use to save his people. Forest. Forest, good. <laughs> Why not? Back to this argument about God's character. Uh huh. Love does not use force. Uh huh. Uh huh. <coughs> yes. Yes. On YouTube. The destruction of the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, probably is this one. Okay. Let's begin. If this is one, this is the one. This is fantastic. And click on captions too, because we want to see the captions. Try this one, yeah. No, 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 you can see it there. You can see it there on the screen. Make it big. Okay, and CC is on the right corner, bottom right. I, I think it's on already. The four-month siege of Jerusalem ordered his entire army to prepare to storm the temple at dawn. This is the one, but this is good. A total of 60,000 Roman legionaries and local auxiliaries were eager to deliver the final blow to the defiant but broken city. Within the walls, half a million starving Jews survived in diabolical conditions. Some were fanatical religious zealots, some were freebooting bandits, but most were innocent families with no escape from this magnificent death trap. Titus set about reducing Jerusalem with systematic efficiency and overwhelming force. The Jews fought for every inch with almost suicidal abandon. As the blistered and jagged hills sprouted forests of fly-blown crucified cadavers, the city within was tormented by a sense of impending doom, intransigent fanaticism, whimsical sadism, and searing hunger. Yet the rebels were still fighting. Although Titus was proving to be a gifted commander and a popular son of the new emperor, Vespasian's unproven dynasty depended on victory over the Jewish rebels. 
Jerusalem was, Josephus observed, like a wild beast gone mad, which, for want of food, fell now upon eating its own flesh. The Romans fought back and pushed the Jews into the temple itself. One legionary, seized with a divine fury, grabbed some burning materials and lit the curtains and frame of a golden window linked to the rooms around the actual temple. By morning, the fire had spread to the very heart of holiness. The Jews, seeing the flames licking the Holy of Holies and threatening to destroy it, made a great clamor and ran to prevent it. But it was too late. They barricaded themselves in the inner court, then watched in a ghast silence. Thousands of civilians and rebels mustered on the steps of the altar, waiting to fight to the last, or just die hopelessly. All had their throats cut by the exhilarated Romans, until around the altar lay dead bodies heaped one upon another, with the blood running down the steps. 10,000 Jews died in the burning temple. A cracking of vast stones and wooden beams made a sound like thunder. Josephus watched the death of the temple. The roar of the flames streaming far and wide mingled with the groans of the falling victims, and owing to the height of the hill and the mass of the burning pile, one would have thought the whole city was ablaze. And then the din, nothing more deafening or appalling could be conceived than that. There were the war cries of the Roman legions sweeping onward, the howls of the rebels encircled by fire and swords, the rush of the people who, cut off above, fled panic-stricken only to fall into the arms of the foe, and their shrieks as they met their fate. You would have thought the Temple Hill was boiling over from its base, being everywhere one mass of flame. Mount Moriah, where King David had placed the Ark of the Covenant, and where his son Solomon had built the first temple was seething hot full of fire on every part of it, while inside dead bodies covered the floors. Now the rampaging Romans, seeing that the inner temple was destroyed, grabbed the gold and furniture, carrying out their swag before they set fire to the rest of the complex. Titus decided to eradicate Jerusalem, a decision which Josephus blamed on the rebels. The rebellion destroyed the city and the Romans destroyed the rebellion. This final desperate struggle would decide not only the fate of the city and her inhabitants, but also the future of Judaism and the small Jewish cult of Christianity, and even, looking forward across six centuries, the shape of Islam. The destruction was also decisive for Christianity. Jerusalem's small Christian community, led by Simon, Jesus' cousin, had escaped from the city before the Romans closed in. Even though there were many non-Jewish Christians living around the Roman world, these Jerusalemites had remained a Jewish sect praying at the temple. But now the temple had been destroyed, the Christians believed that the Jews had lost the favor of God. The followers of Jesus separated forever from the mother faith, claiming to be the rightful heirs to the Jewish heritage. Christians envisaged a new celestial Jerusalem, not a shattered Jewish city. In the seventh century AD, when Muhammad founded his new religion, the destruction of the temple proved for him, too, that God had withdrawn his blessing from Jews and bestowed it on Islam. It is ironic that the decision of Titus to destroy Jerusalem helped make the city the very template of holiness for the other two peoples of the book. From the very beginning, Jerusalem's sanctity did not just evolve, but was promoted by the decisions of a handful of men. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your efforts. Although this is not the one that I was looking for. This one, I watched this one before and it was good. A lot of violence there. But remember, 
<laughs> Remember, without the destruction of Jerusalem, the Christians we will never spread. We will never go to Rome, for example. <laughs> and I have here, at the end of this uh, quarterly, some questions to think about. And the first one is this. What value does persecution serve? Why do you think God allows his people to suffer at times? Let me give you a hint. Let me help you. I grew up under communism, oppression. You are not allowed to do this, to do that, to do evangelism, to have a second service. And because of that, the church was strong. The faith was strong. Is it a paradox or what? Help me to understand what's going on. When you are persecuted, <laughs> and you know you are persecuted for a right cause, without retaliating, boom, you just turn the other cheek. Without, I'm going to sue you. When you are persecuted for the right cause, it looks like your faith <laughs> increases. Brother John, tell well, us, what's it, the magic here? Well, I don't think it's magic. I think it's heavenly power. Um, historically, when a church is suffering, it seems to settle in and get stronger. And I think it's because of the direct involvement of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Because we wouldn't have the power to do that ourselves. Mm. But there's an interesting comment here on Friday's lesson where one of the historical writers, one of the, one of the Christian talked about the blood of Christians is seed. In other words, the more, the more you kill us, the more, our, the more people see how we suffer mm -hmm. and how we react to suffering, they're involved. The because. They, they become more and more involved in, you know, they, it becomes more obvious who's on the right and who's on the wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we're seeing it even in, even in today's world mm. with the Israeli and, and Palestinian conflict. The more violence that is, that is produced, it seems like people settle into their beliefs. You're wrong or right? <laughs> uh, Pastor, I got something. Kind of piggybacking on what John said. Please. It seems like when uh, persecution and our freedom is, is challenged, it seems like it draws people more together to God. Uh -huh. When we have things that are easy in life, uh, sometimes we become Laodicea. We become complacent. Uh, so I could see that uh, the siege in Jerusalem yes. brought the Christians. Yes. So they got out before the 70 A.D. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. destruction. Yes. Because G you know, they went to a place called Pella, mm -hmm. foothills, mm -hmm. mountains. So they knew what was coming. The, the siege was pulled back by General Gallius, and then they got out in 67, and then in 70, Titus came in and destroyed it. So, mm -hmm. so I think people appreciate uh, sometimes faith better when they're when they're being oppressed in persecution. Okay, so is it okay to pray for persecution to come? Is my next question. I don't think you should be praying for persecution. If the persecution is makes us stronger in faith, why not? Wait, wait a minute. Uh, no one likes to be persecuted and killed. No, no one enjoys that. Right? Uh, even, even as Christians. They are sadistic people. We don't, we don't no. But it seems that without it, we are not going to lose. We are not going to. Um, it seems that without it, we don't say, seem to have the motivation to do what God wants us to do. So, what does God do? Mm. Permit this tool to be used. Uh huh. 
to permit. I like that word. Yes, because because then, what did the Christians have to do? Mm. The things that attach that they were attached to that prevents them prevented them from doing God's work. They had to abandon it. Mm. Now their focus now is not to hold on to material things, but to think heavenward, and all their thoughts now go heavenward, and their faith now has to be exercised. Now they have nothing to rely on as material, and therefore now their, their only trust is in God. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where God wants all of us to be. Mm -hmm. Anita? Um, I was just going to say that for the Christian, it says here in the scripture memory verse, I will strengthen you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, and for the Christian, we don't look for persecution, but should it come, the Lord has fortified us to withstand this and to go through that persecution. Thank you. So it's a blessing in persecution. And when we think about persecution, we think about government coming in, you know, like, like I experienced in Romania. How about persecution coming from one of your brother or sister? This is much more difficult to endure, much more difficult. Pastor. Yes, brother. The, the attitude of the saints who study their Bibles, it's, it's different. You know, they, we, or they, we know that it's going to happen, that it's um, going to be family and friends, the ones who are so close that we've been trying to reach. Um, the most unbelievably um, given us the more more trouble than people who are strangers to us mm -hmm. and um, we see it we, you can see it you can feel it the stiff neckness uh, what you call it the, the stony mm. hearts Jesus said I came to bring what the sword, the sword. can you explain that Ooh. The word, the sword. Where is the love of God? You came to, you came to, where is something else here implying? Is Jesus, uh, Jesus came to where the attitude <laughs> was for or against him? And it's like a sword. It's a war. Yeah, the, the word. Somebody else? I got a question for Please. you, uh, for your personal experience. Uh -huh. You're coming from a communist uh, domination. Yes. And coming to freedom here. Yeah. Do you see a difference in the uh, the way people appreciate religion more from the that didn't have the freedoms in the communist country versus here? Do you see like it was it's more appreciated over when it was when you had the Iron Curtain? Good question. Thank you. Yes, it, it was more appreciated, and although we are persecuted. There were a lot of the persecutors admiring our faith. Hmm. And they're telling me, this is my job. I have no other choice. I need to keep my, uh, my position. So I have to yell at you. Oh, you, you are a sect and you are an American spy. Please forgive me. I have to do this. It happened this way. It happened this way. Of course, some of them were fanatics, communists, uh, brainwash. Now, what I am seeing here is that we are so complacent, so lax. Everybody, freedom, yeah, Jesus, Jesus, oh, I, I know that. And we are secular society. We became a secular society, pushing God outside of the picture. And God is here when we are in trouble and eventually, please help me. And if he's not going to help me, okay. Hmm. This is the problem. And Jerusalem, again, it's surrounded by army. This time, the army of the Lucifer himself. Amen. And those beasts from Revelation 13, the two ones, are... And we have an opportunity to escape. It's called the second coming of Jesus. The only. Yes. Back to your question about whether we should pray for persecution. Mm -hmm. 
we, we acknowledge the fact that historically persecution has strengthened the church. Mm. But we also acknowledge the fact that we're told to ask for the winds of strife to be held back so we can finish our work. Mm -hmm. I think the answer to what we should pray for is, Lord, whatever it takes, if persecution is what it's going to take to save us, bring it on. But if it's your will that we have more time to work, then mm. hold back the winds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you go to the section uh, of uh, uh, April 10, the Wednesday section, you will see something interesting. They knew that the word of Jesus uh, are going to be fulfilled. When you will see Jerusalem surrounded, when you will see the... Um, was the, the, the line there? The, the, yes. Be careful. Abomination. Yes. You run. You run. Although you pray, Don't it should not be in the Sabbath or in the winter, but you run away. Don't go back and get anything. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Although they knew that, they didn't just stay and uh, watching is the abomination of uh, are they coming or not oh, oh well, I, I have one more day here let's go to beach let's go to uh, our routine what did they do during this time what did they do during this time of waiting for the disaster to hit the community of Christians in Jerusalem according to Wednesday section, which is, have a title there. What's the title? <laughs> what did they do? They ministered. They ministered. They continued the ministry of Jesus. And what was the ministry of Jesus? Preaching, teaching, healing, helping, feeding, clothing, Now, let's bring this picture here. Okay, for starters, desolation and destruction are coming. Oh, yes. Yeah. You cannot pray for or against. You cannot beg God to not do it. <laughs> yeah, well, my prayer is, Lord, be come soon. And he will say, if I will come soon, uh, are they prepared? Yeah, are you prepared? That's the question. I can come tomorrow. That's the question. There are so many Bible study to do. There are so many, there are billions of people who have no idea. And it's the miracle of the Holy Spirit to touch them. Okay. Help me. This is the ministry. There were, I see in Matthew 24, as Christ describes what was happening, two classes of people. Hmm. There were the hardcore Jewish people and leaders who want, all they wanted was to uh, get rid of the Romans and prepare to give their lives for hmm. it. And then on the other hand, we had a small sect of followers of Jesus who were bent on following Christ's words. Mm -hmm. And that is what you just described as yes. to what they were doing. Yeah. But look, look, what's going to happen here? Um, in Matthew 24, verse, verse um, 9 says, Then, after you have done all this, then you will be handed over to be persecuted. We are not going to walk into it voluntarily. And put, uh, and says, um, and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations, but not because you're rich or poor, but because of me, for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. So, they were carrying the banner of Christ forward. And because of that, people hated Jesus. And so this, the devil hated them. Mm -hmm. Also, like how he hated Jesus. The moment we... And what proves that we are not doing what the disciples back then were doing is the fact that I don't sense anyone is hating us yet mm -hmm. to the point where they want to kill us and get rid of us. Mm -hmm. But the moment we open our mouth and begin to proclaim the love of Christ, the gospel message... You watch and see if persecution is not going to come. It will come, for sure. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. There's a dichotomy here, though, because we, we know that persecution is going to come and it's going to be encouraged by the church and the fact that they're standing for truth. But also, if you look at Wednesday's lesson, it says, because the church was living the gospel, it grew. No. Oh, you hit the nail exactly in the head. Thank you. Brother Allen. So you have both happening. Yes. Uh, your home country is Malawi, yes? A lot of Christians there, yeah? A lot of Adventists as well. Now, imagine the whole country, let's say 99% will be Muslim, okay? How, will, how is going to be your life and your ministry comparing to now, if the whole country is Muslim country? And, you know, of course, persecuting. Uh, do you have a microphone? Yes. Okay, good, please. Uh, well, the perception, just thinking, it will, it's going to be very hard. And um, if it can be 99% or, say, 80%, 70%, and then they are persecuted, I'll tell you a scene that just happened yesterday. Hmm. Uh, a, a, a nun, a Catholic nun, was going to church. A car stopped with four Muslims in the car. They beat her. Mm. She's in the hospital right now. Mm. And it's a national thing. They were actually saying, we hate you Christians. Mm. So the question would be, how do we feel? Mm. But how do we feel now that things are like mm. that are starting? But it's going to be a hard, yeah. a hard way to live in a country, in, mm. a, in such a country. Mm -hmm. And maybe a war can can erupt, I think. Now you have two alternatives. I know one alternative to, means two. you have, you can run to United States of America. Mm -hmm. And for now is no persecution mm -hmm. and you are free. Or you can stay there and witness it. What will be a best alternative? What will be your choice? As I'm sorry, a, as, as taking a, your personal here. Yeah, I know, that's okay. But as a human, I'd run. <laughs> <laughs> I'd run. I, I know you didn't come here because of that. But no. uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's running away from persecution wrong. Yes. Didn't Answer to this first, please. And after did, that. Didn't the disciples, didn't Christ followers were asked to leave huh? and run into the mountains as well? said uh -huh. didn't they run they run yes they did they got away they did yeah you go on, go on down there okay kill me now no you have a lot of things to do you have a family you have a ministry yeah when it is no other choice yes you surrender to but have this, the same goal in your mind the same goal in your mind pastor when you uh, here first and then there I was just going to say, we think about the persecution and how many of the Christians avoided the persecution by running. But then we think of people like Stephen, mm. who died for his faith, and his death resulted in the growth of the church. The brethren, I mean, his own people, the Jewish so the people. Quest, the question would be not, what should I do, what do I feel like doing, but what, would, what will the Holy Spirit have me to do? Some are going to stay and die. Some are going to run. But if we're led by the Spirit, we don't have to worry. Thank you. I was just going to say that the people, Jesus told them what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they obeyed. Yes, they so did. So they, they were prepared for this. Yeah, Somehow, we prepared yeah. for this. Yeah. You prepare, you prepare until, you know, <laughs> when they're telling you something beforehand, you think you are prepared. But See, the, the in thing the middle is, of the struggle... There's, there's not 100% sure why that Gallius retreated in 67 AD, uh -huh. but God knew what yes. was going to happen. Yes. And that's when they took advantage of the situation and left. Yes. And then in 70 AD, Titus came in and did his... Yes. Thank you. Let's move this from persecution because we are talking about what we have no idea. I know. We have no idea. You know. 
when our neighbor look at me like this, you know, not saying hello, I think I'm persecuted. Oh, this is nothing. Uh, yeah, this is nothing. Um, let's move to uh, question number two at the end of uh, uh, the lesson. How would you respond if a friend asks you these questions? What questions? Number one. What question? Where is God in my suffering? Where is God in my suffering? In my suffering. This is one. Second one. Yes. He loves me. Why am I going through such a difficult time? Thank you. There are church people who are down because they don't have the right answer to those two questions. Of course, they are difficult questions. There are church people knowing exactly what day of worship uh, we should keep, what kind of food we should eat. How many uh, churches are in Revelation chapter 2 and 3? Okay, they, they know that. But they are not clear regarding this, 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 uh, this issue here. Why? Where is God in my suffering? Because, you know, in my mind, I, I know, I know the right answer. That, yeah, he's, he cares, yeah? He cares. He cares even for the sparrow. We, we have a song. It's a beautiful song. But look at me. And I'm praying. And one year, two years, four years, I'm, I, I'm experiencing this, this problem. Health problem, usually. Or a family problem, separation, divorce, death of loved one, an accident, something. And you don't have the answer. If you don't have the answer, there's somebody else giving you an answer. Do you think God is, oh, maybe God is not even existing, it's in your mind. Okay. Look at you. Where is your, you know, you served God for so many years. Look at you. Doesn't care. What is going to be your answer? We have a few minutes here. So this is, this is very important. Jorane, please. I won't go into the whole story, but uh, a young lady was uh, dating a uh, pastor's uh, son at a tent effort and a Bible worker was working with her in New York City, the Bronx. And one night she walked home and she was assaulted in an abandoned building and she told them they shunned her, uh, you know, like she had done something wrong mm -hmm. and the girl was, you know, dedicated. And the Bible worker, she, uh, was mad with God. She didn't want to have anything more to do with him. And so one day, the Holy Spirit said, there is redemption in unmerited suffering. And that's when she turned back to God. Mm -hmm. That that girl suffered unmeritedly, but she will be redeemed one day. Of course. Yes. Yes. Well, I know, I know a lot of those type of stories. Thank you. Um, in the back there. Gabby, please. Give her a mic. Yeah. Actually, this is a very good question. Lately, for the last few, a lot of months, um, going through a whole lot. Mm. I mean, I was serving the church. I love the church. Everything was going well. And then avalanched with so much, it was overwhelming. And I did ask, and I was angry. Why are you doing this to me? I mean, I'm... I'm, t I'm here for you, what is going on? And I mean, it, it came to the point where it was close to, I was gonna end it, I mean, it was bad. Mm. So in all this, I realized the answer he was trying to give me. And um, he was trying to tell me something. He's trying to communicate this to me. That um, in all of this that was happening, I had my family, I had the church. I called on Sister Doranita. I called on everybody. I was not alone anymore. Amen. 
And that is something that God, I realized, was teaching me. It's telling me, I'm putting you through this because I need you to know this. And as soon as I realized that, I came back and I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm not alone anymore because I've always been alone. I realized my family was there for me and they stood by me and they've been standing by me and then all the church. And I was like, okay. It was, I mean, I, it was a lesson I had to learn. So I think God sometimes lets you suffer. And like, you need to know something. You need to learn something. You need to tell, I love you, but look who I surrounded you with. Look what I've done for you. Look what's happening. And it's like, it's, it's a question that was answered for me and what I'm going through. Thank and you. so it's been, it's been amazing. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, you touched my heart with your answer. Uh, John and uh, Anita. I think the fact that we're studying the great controversy, mm -hmm. another name for this book is the cosmic conflict. Yes. If we can look at things in a, in a not just our little world involved, but how the universe is involved in this fight over God's character, it helps us to understand that we, we may not see the big picture because our view is so, so small, but there's a bigger story behind it. Uh, I like what it says on Wednesday's lesson. It says, the, in this great controversy, the devil is trying to deface the image of God. The purpose of the gospel is to restore the image of God. Yes. Sir. Anita? No, I was just going to say right quick, uh, Pastor Ovid, last night, yesterday evening, I had the opportunity to witness to a young lady. And, you know, the Lord placed upon my heart to call her. And all of a sudden, this river began to flow up out of her, mm. her sufferings and her pain because she has some very, very serious challenges she's going through right now. And I just listened to her as, as she poured out all, the, all these things. And so she wants to know about God, Amen. our Lord and Savior. And I, what I relate, related to her was that Jesus is right there with you. He's waiting for you. A lot of times we suffer these things in life you know, and don't quite know these answers to it, don't have the answers, but I was able to witness to her about the love of Jesus for her. And as a result of that, she wants Bible studies. And as a result of that, she wants to come out. Thank you. And, and heal her relationship with the Lord. Yes, yes, good point. Good when you say Bible study, yeah, I'm always looking to be, um, with, with someone, and the Bible study is just, a, let's, let's say, uh, a, a pretext to really, you know, be one-on-one, -on -one. because it's not just question and answer, question and answer, you know, it's how you feel today, what about this, and you, you know that person, you are establishing a relationship in time. I always encourage, I, I will always encourage you to not give the whole set of 2024 20, Okay, you study and done. Take time with that person and listening, because everybody have a story. N maybe not so dramatic and complicated and cancer, and, but everybody have a story. And the scars that person is hiding, sometimes it appears, and you know that person better which will bring you, uh, me to the last question here, but uh, I hear uh, several hands here, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say what Anita shared is, um, reminds me that sometimes God may use something to draw us close to him. And so had that woman, we don't know, yeah. been receptive yeah. to studying with Anita and understanding God and his love and the fact that he's right there with you mm -hmm. if she weren't going through the suffering that yes. she's going through. Yes. God allow me to suffer not because I got an illness but because my son got an illness and that is the worst kind of suffering. If it's you, it's okay. You go to doctors, 
you pray, you're not happy, you're angry after that you are at peace, but when you see somebody else that you love and care and you have no power to do anything, that is breaking you. And that, after that, if you understand the war, <laughs> is allowing you to minister to someone who experienced the same thing. Yes, Sister Vinod. <coughs> we did not um, hit on April 11th on Thursday, but um, going through the lesson this week, mm -hmm. um, I hold, held on to this um, thought about love mm -hmm. and how um, back then it, in, the, in, the, in the early centuries, it was a norm of Christian communities um, to show love to the Christians, to, I mean to people. And the love that they shared, it was um, unselfish, sacrificial, caring, loving ministry of Christians that made a huge impact on the population. And over time, thousands, he said, even millions in the Roman Empire became believers in Jesus during this epidemic. So it brought me back to when we had COVID and, um, and a lot of the people that work in the health care ministry, nurses can relate to this that um, it was a way of showing our unselfish um, or gratitude or love and we just went in not fearing what could happen to us but um, even we have to die a lot of healthcare workers die from helping others mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. joined the church too because mm -hmm. of the pandemic you know and in that time a lot of Christians a lot of us help other people mm -hmm. Check on them, ask them if they were, had food, if they were sick, we help them. So that's the way how God cares for us. Mm. This is just an example to show that His love is, you know, His love is unselfish. He has undying love. His character is caring, loving, sharing. And this is what we should be doing for our, our community, yes. our church, yes. our neighbors, you know. So um, that's my thought, you know, what I got from Very this week's lesson. Now, this, this is the last point here, so uh, number three here. How can our local church become a caring community to impact the world? The world, wow. Discuss practical ways to apply this week's study. Uh, we feel uncomfortable, we feel not adequate, we don't have a space, we don't have a good kitchen, uh, we are busy, maybe now, next time. Uh, well, what can we do right now? We can invite them to a seminar. We can invite them to uh, a church service, and after that we have food. Uh, we, can, we can volunteer to go to their homes and have a Bible study. Yeah? What other things? We have uh, um, pathfinders. We have a uh, soccer program. We have uh, um, children's ministry. We have health program. Yes. I want to share something. Sure, short and sweet, yeah. My twins, they have <laughs> phones. And there's a young man that they were talking to, Michael. And I rejected it. But last night, Mimi said, Grandma, he's a Christian. I said, oh, wow. Guess what? There are other churches. This young man said, he wanted to know where our church was. And I told him, he said, I've been to this church before. He said, I'm really serious about Bible study. Mm -hmm. He said, I have steps to Christ. I have prophets and kings. And he is a first day young man. He, wanted, he would be here today, but I didn't answer the question in time. But <laughs> the message is being spread. He wants to come to church with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The central issue, love or love? Self-love. <laughs> when you say, it, I love to be loved, that is not love. It's selfishness, yes? Amen. How difficult is for a selfish person to be a patient and to suffer? Huh? You said something about nurse, nurses, you know? How difficult is for a nurse to care for a very selfish patient? I don't like the food. I don't, I don't. 
Hey, you didn't come here in time. Oh, oh, all the time. Yes. So, um, you have to ask the Holy Spirit to be with you once you go to that environment. Because yeah. you face so much stuff. You know, it, it is mind-boggling to know what we face when yeah, we yeah, go yeah. Into, into work in a healthcare environment. We have to, the Holy Spirit has to be with you. And sometimes I take the time with an extra minute or two to talk to people because they're, they're, most, that, that they're at their most vulnerable point. That they're so sick, some of them think they're dying. Mm -hmm. You know, and they try to take it out on us. And so, and so we have to ask God to help us to let them feel, you know, his love, show his love to them in a way that, you know, and they say, oh, they look at you, who are you? And, and when they see the love of God flowing through you, talking mm -hmm. to them, they, you know, it's a different feeling that you give them. We have a different hope. Thank you. So, yes. One more line, and we're done with this, because we don't have time. <clears throat> Our problems today, persecutions, and illness, and family problems, and discomfort are going to prepare us to serve others, are going to prepare us to face the time of trouble, the real time of trouble, if you have the right understanding of this cosmic war between Christ and Lucifer. Without this in the background, everything is blur, everything is going according to my feelings. I feel today that I am persecuted, I am mad. Tomorrow I feel that everything is okay, I am good. We have to keep this background of that we are in a war here. And when we see someone in the church kind of unhappy and answering in a mean way, it's nothing personal. He is in the war. She is in the war. We have to help. That is one of the major roles of, a, a beginning, of a be, uh, belonging to, uh, to a church like the Seventh-day Adventist church here supporting each other because we have the right doctrine but we have to have the right attitude may lord bless us all brother john can you dismiss us with a prayer please loving father in heaven we thank you for this opportunity to discuss these cosmic events help us to realize that the end is coming and you're doing everything you can in your great love to prepare us. Help us to be willing to be used so that we can also help prepare someone else. Yes. Just continue to go with us, guide and direct and bless us. Give us your Holy Spirit strength, we pray. In Jesus' name.